So I'm Mike Tilly. I'm a uh, orthopedic surgeon in uh, Topeka, Kansas, working through the uh, Stormont Vale uh, Health System. Um, I did my orthopedic residency at the University of Kansas and my trauma fellowship at the University of uh, Minnesota. And I have the pleasure uh, today of uh, talking to you about uh, treating osteoporotic-related insufficiency fracture uh, non-unions in both the uh, anterior and posterior aspect of the uh, pelvis with a Curbifix uh, uh, device. What we'll uh, get into with this is just a case uh, uh, presentation and uh, demonstration of some of the um, uh, difficulties in, in these uh, osteofixation pathways and these uh, osteoporotic uh, uh, fractures and fracture non-unions, uh, typically because there's some deformity involved uh, with them and also some issues with uh, uh, bone quality. Uh, so, uh, to start, this is a 57-year-old uh, female who had a uh, fall at home in July of uh, 2021. She presented to me uh, nearly a year later in June of um, uh, 20, or in uh, late spring of 22, um, with this. Uh, she had seen uh, several other uh, providers. I think she'd seen three other uh, orthopedic surgeons in different parts of the state. Uh, before getting re uh, referred uh, uh, to me uh, for this issue. Uh, when she was uh, first seen, uh, this was uh, thought to be a, uh, a stable uh, insuff insufficiency fractures of both the uh, um, posterior and anterior aspects of the pelvis, and she was told that this would heal uh, uneventfully, and she didn't need any type of surgical uh, treatment um, uh, with this. Her pre-injury uh, status is uh, fairly typical for these patients that, uh, that I'm seeing with this, where she was uh, getting around without any uh, assistive devices uh, whatsoever. She's relatively young, but she's also osteoporotic. She has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she's pretend, she's a, a touch malnourished when we uh, checked her labs for her osteoporosis uh, workup um, with this. And uh, she also smokes at least, uh, she's cut down to a pack a day from who knows what it was uh, before that. Uh, so she's a little bit younger than the typical patient I'm seeing with this, but, uh, you know, kind of has some other factors that may throw her, throw her into a more advanced uh, uh, age. Um, other things that, that play a part in this is you can see she has some uh, uh, a degenerative scully with her lower lumbar spine, and she was uh, set up to uh, was uh, scheduled to have a um, lumbar spine procedure a month uh, after she uh, fell, and that was canceled secondary to her pelvic uh, uh, injury, and she's uh, yet to have that uh, uh, done. So these are the films that she presented uh, to me with. You can see that she uh, has a fairly obvious. Um, fracture the in inferior and uh, the root of the superior uh, ramus in the front of the pelvis, and certainly something going on with that SI joint in the uh, back, a uh, uh, possible subluxation and fracture involving her posterior pelvis on that uh, uh, right side uh, with it. Um, she's had several uh, CT scans and, and uh, radiographs uh, throughout the several months leading up to her uh, presenting uh, to me. And this is just another look at inlet and outlet uh, uh, films that re-demonstrate this. Uh, you also have some Jude films where you can get uh, some ideas on the bony reabsorption that she had around that uh, uh, fracture that extended into the uh, anterior wall through the root of the uh, uh, superior uh, ramus <clears throat> on this uh, uh, view as well. Um, this is her uh, uh, CT scan, which shows the uh, injury on the right side and also an injury on the uh, uh, left side of the pelvis uh, as well. The uh, uh, image on the uh, uh, right is getting into the anterior wall superior root uh, fracture non-union, where you can see that she has a significant amount of bony reabsorption uh, with it. There was some concern uh, prior to her seeing me of this uh, may be a pathologic uh, uh, fracture second to tumor. Uh, her workup for that was uh, uh, negative, and this was an isolated lesion. And in my review of this, this looks more like uh, bony reabsorption around a uh, chronic non-union uh, site uh, more than any type of uh, uh, tumor in this. And with any uh, bilateral uh, sacral fractures, you always want to look at a lateral, uh, be it on the sagittal recons on the CT scan or a lateral sacral view. And with her, you can see that she has some kyphotic deformity through the, um, probably the S3 segment of her uh, uh, pelvis. 
you can see that uh, uh, four or five uh, slip and that degenerative disc uh, that she has above this. Uh, those are all things to keep in mind because it's going to affect your ability to, to image uh, her with fluoroscopy uh, within the uh, OR. Also, these people tend to have fairly um, poor bone quality and their, their uh, imaging can be uh, uh, somewhat difficult um, in these uh, uh, cases. This is uh, some sagittal cuts to that superior ramus uh, fracture, and you see the bony resorption um, uh, through that uh, area as well. Um, one of the things that's, uh, I think, extremely important to these people is to get their nutrition status uh, back up to on par. Uh, you want to look at their albumin, uh, make sure that it's getting up above 3.4 uh, is typically kind of what I'm looking at. Uh, for it. It's not necessarily a reason not to operate on these people, but you want to try to optimize both their nutritional status and their um, and their osteoporotic uh, uh, treatment, whether that's getting them on uh, some anabolic uh, uh, agents and getting their vitamin D and everything corrected. Um, you can either do that through a, um, a bone health uh, clinic or in endocrinology uh, is the most typical way that those those are done and um, you know that's a very important part of uh, uh, treating these uh, uh, patients overall will uh, help your success uh, when you do uh, have to operate on these. Uh, this is some interoperative uh, um, pictures of this. Uh, one thing uh, to know is the exchange tube that's in the posterior aspect of this. So I started uh, where I knew that it would be the easiest to get a path across um, with <clears throat> the starting point uh, for these posterior screws. Typically, I'm going to start more inferior or more posterior on the uh, uh, lateral wall of the ilium uh, than, than what I would for a traditional uh, straight screw. That way I can start that pitch and help kind of build the curve uh, into the implant because you don't uh, want this implant to be put in uh, straight across. You do want a uh, curve to it so you can um, uh, take advantage of its uh, um, ability to to uh, resist the uh, uh, moment of rotation. That's, a, that's about the uh, um, pelvis uh, uh, there in the back. Um, this is a, a view of the uh, um, putting the implant in the front. Uh, I always uh, try to get uh, my wires and the exchange tube in in the back before I start doing anything in the front. That way you're not uh, blocked in any of your imaging by an implant already being um, uh, there. Uh, typically, um, when I'm starting these uh, for the front, I'll start them uh, typically a little bit more uh, superior and posterior uh, than what I would typically start because you have to get the first three centimeters um, in where it's going to be straight and then you want to try to get some curve built on this. The This is a situation where a smaller implant uh, uh, would be of some advantage as you'll see on some later cuts where this is a pretty tight fit for, the, for this. I uh, measured the uh, um, canal diameter uh, through the superior uh, ramus on the uh, intact anterior uh, aspect of this fracture at approximately 9.5 to 9.7 uh, um, millimeters uh, preoperatively, and this is a 9.3 millimeter uh, implant, so it doesn't give you a whole lot of room. Um, and the um, I was just told uh, earlier uh, today that the uh, uh, smaller version of this implant is FDA approved at uh, this point in time. This is what her final construct looked like, where you can see that you have a nice curve uh, built into the back. And this curve can be not only in the um, cephalic caudad direction, but also in the anterior posterior uh, direction. And you see that there is some um, nonlinear uh, appearance to the screw through the anterior column. Uh, the only note I would make on, on this is it would be nice to take and, and curve the wire towards the midline on this. Uh, as I'll demonstrate in a later uh, slide, uh, the uh, threads of this do, do come out in the front, which is fairly typical when you're putting in a straight implant, uh, at least in my hands. I, I see that fairly commonly where you'll come out right beside the pubic tubercle uh, uh, with this, uh, especially in these uh, smaller 
uh, corridors uh, with this. Uh, this is her um, post-op um, imaging um, with it, and you can see the implants in place on the AP and also the inlet inlet outlet views and a, a Jude uh, view where you can see it crossing uh, across there providing some stability to it. I am still uh, CTing uh, these um, mostly for my own education to ensure that I am uh, indeed putting these implants where I intend for them to go and I'm not get, being fooled on any of my two-dimensional imaging uh, uh, intraoperatively. Um, with it. Uh, unfortunately, we're not very good at uh, getting uh, metal subtraction imaging uh, at my institution on these, so there's usually quite a bit of uh, um, scatter and uh, artifact around the implants uh, with these, uh, but you can see the screw crossing in the in the back um, there, and then also uh, crossing that um, non-union site in the front, and getting down where it's filling uh, that canal in the front. Like I said before, this is a fairly tight fit uh, in there, so you are getting good intermedially uh, fill and contact with that, M much like putting an intermedially nail in a, an ismic type uh, uh, fracture uh, in a long bone. The, uh, and you can see the screws where they do exit um, uh, out here uh, in the front, uh, but generally that's, that's not uncommon uh, for me to see when I when I put in um, traditional uh, straight screws, uh, but curving the tip of that wire towards the midline may may help with that in the in the future. Um, this is her follow up at approximately two to three weeks out. There's no obvious implant failure uh, at this point in time. She's uh, still on her walker, but she uh, states that her pain is uh, uh, much better. Um, uh, with it, and she is able to, uh, prior to her surgery, her husband would say that she could walk from the kitchen to the living room, and that's about it. She could not stand to um, make supper and was very limited on, in her ability to be upright uh, with the with this, and that uh, has improved with the fixation of these uh, fractures. This is uh, approximately uh, six to eight weeks out, and again, she's maintaining uh, her implant uh, uh, placement. And there's no uh, obvious loosening. There's no obvious uh, failure. Uh, she's uh, beginning to progress off her walker. She's still having a significant amount of pain. Uh, my suspicion this is coming uh, a lot from her uh, lumbar uh, spine. As I uh, said before, she was uh, scheduled for a lumbar spine surgery before uh, this this occurred. Um, and I think that she's still symptomatic from that four or five slip and likely some stenosis uh, in that aspect, which I I think is playing a part in in, in her uh, um, being somewhat slow to progress. In my experience, uh, patients that have just this problem, non-associated um, lumbar spine issue with it, uh, the vast majority of these that I've been taking care of are are significantly better and off their assisted devices uh, within within a few weeks after their operation. And most of them will say they're significantly more comfortable nearly immediately afterwards. So I think that uh, providing some fixation, some stability in these um, insufficiency fraction on unions um, can uh, significantly help people mobilize and return to a better quality of life uh, with this. And I think this is a um, implant that allows us to uh, more safely um, traverse on these um, difficult osseofixation pathways, particularly when there's a significant amount of deformity um, with it. Um, that kind of covers what I have for you guys. Thank you, guys.